Well, welcome everybody. Thank you, Hannah. It's lovely to see so many familiar faces and old friends again, and I'm sure we're going to have a wonderful meeting. And I think it's great that once again we're having our public outreach session as the first event of the meeting. It's so important that we communicate our science to the people who pay for it and explain its relevance and its critical importance going forward. So first up, I'll introduce our first speaker, Professor John Newnham from the University of Western Australia. John is Professor of Obstetrics at the University of Western Australia and a subspecialist in maternal fetal medicine. He's head of the University Division of ONG based at King Edward Memorial Hospital and Chief Scientific Director of the Women and Infants Research Foundation. His research is all about prevention of preterm birth and the early life origins of disease, so having a healthy start to life. And he's involved and has led many clinical and laboratory-based studies, the RAIN study and the Western Australian Preterm Prevention Initiative amongst them. So thank you, John. We're going to hear from you about preventing preterm birth in Western Australia. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming on a, on a sun, sunny Sunday afternoon. Uh, and um, I am very privileged and honoured to be here talking about really my favourite topic, and that is preventing preterm birth. So after 20 or 30 years of research studies conducted by ourselves and others, uh, we thought we had the information base that we needed uh, to launch uh, a prevention of preterm birth program across the state of Western Australia. People have done it in various, in various components across the world, but no one's ever taken a full geographical area and imposed a whole of population program across it uh, to see what would happen using current, current knowledge. And so that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So preventing preterm birth in Western Australia. I'm sure you all know what preterm birth is. It's birth before 37 completed weeks of gestation. In Australia, it's about 8 to 9% of all births. Aboriginals, it's about 14 to 15%. Uh, we have 3,000 a year here in Western Australia. And you may not know that preterm birth is the single greatest cause of death and morbidity in children up to five years of age in developed countries. So as an obstetrician, the one thing that would be most valuable to do with one's career would be to work out how to lower the rate of preterm birth. So can we prevent preterm birth? And I like to look upon this uh, as a tree, an apple tree or a fruit tree and say, where would we go to if we wanted to, to, start, to start with this ambition? And the answer is we would go for the low-hanging fruit first. So what is the low-hanging fruit of preterm birth? And, and these are the interventions we chose. So we, in 2014, decided that we would run with these interventions. So based on evidence, uh, not speculative, things that would work in Western Australia and which we knew we could apply across the entire state of Western Australia. So first of all, and the most important, is that no pregnancy is to be ended until at least 38 and a half weeks gestation without obstetric or medical justification. Now, if there's a complication of pregnancy, then that's not included in this story. But delivering babies before this age just because you can or you're going on holidays or the husband's a FIFO worker or so, no longer good enough. Then we introduced measurement of the length of the cervix in, at all mid-pregnancy scans across Western Australia. So every mid-pregnancy morphology scan was to include, include the length of the cervix uh, and we ran the very strong policy that it is the right of every West Australian woman to know the length of her cervix in mid-pregnancy. Next, if the cervix was shortened, that day she was to be prescribed natural vaginal progesterone pessaries, one each evening, 200 milligrams, and we, and we set up the system such that no matter where you were in Western Australia, a doctor would prescribe that treatment for you that evening. If the cervix continued to shorten, and, and at this stage we left solid information base, but if the cervix continued to shorten, uh, we would then choose between continuing just with the progesterone or adding cyclage. I won't talk about that more today. We also introduced natural vaginal progesterone pessaries for any case where there had been prior preterm birth, but, uh, be up to 34 weeks gestation, either with or without ruptured membranes. We beefed up our smoking campaign. Smoking rates in Western Australia have fallen in pregnancy to 12% by 
but have remained at 50% for Aboriginal women. So we've, we've, been, we've got a lot of work left to do. And we started a new preterm birth prevention clinic at, at the major hospital. This slide shows you what cervixes look like. This is what a cervix looks like in uh, mid-pregnancy. So this is, this is all the cervix. This is on a transvaginal scan. That's the internal os, uh, that's the, ex the internal os, that's the external os, and that's the distance. That's what a normal cervix looks like in mid-pregnancy. Upper limb, it, it needs to be 25 millimetres or more. This is normal. This is what we're looking for. This is a shortened cervix of 13 millimetres. This woman needs progesterone to be prescribed that day. And then this is what we never want to see, which is an open cervix, probably all too late. So natural vaginal progesterone pessaries given for the woman in the mid, the mid image will halve her risk of preterm birth. So what is the evidence-based? Well, this, these are the forest plots. This is evidence-based medicine. And, and these are each represent randomised controlled trials with the, with the medians and the 95% confidence intervals and less than one means that it's reduced the incidence and if there's daylight here, it means it's statistically significant. And this is the meta-analysis of all of them and this shows, this is the evidence base that if you give vaginal progesterone pessaries to women with a short cervix in mid-pregnancy, you will nearly halve her risk of preterm birth. This slide shows the evidence base for giving progesterone based on history, and it's the same, whether it be intramuscular, which the Americans favour, vaginal, which we favour, or if you look at the combined meta-analysis, it's about the same. So giving progesterone to a woman with a history of prior preterm birth will halve her risk of recurrence in the future. So what, how did we do it? What did we do? Well, we embarked upon a combined public health uh, and, and clinical education program such that no one in Western Australia was to be left untouched by the knowledge of what we would like to be done. And we're aided in this state, as the place is ideal for it, because we have a single tertiary level centre, King Edward, which services the entire state. So we take the, the preterm labours and the referrals from Kununurra in the north, Esperance in the east and Albany in the south. So everybody relates to one system, one referral base, and we've trained just about everybody out there. So we are in a very unique position to be able to influence what's happening. So we didn't have any money. We've run this on a shoestring budget, uh, but we won a couple of, uh, what well, came second actually, in a couple of marketing competitions which gave us free advertising. So these are some of the advertisements that appeared in the West Australian. These were the, the, our four standard ones, and the, these, are co these are called call to actions. So these are to direct you to the website. Now the whole program's called The Whole Nine Months, which Jeff Keelan actually named. We were running a little competition to name it, uh, and Jeff Keelan, Jeff Keelan named it. But anyway, The Whole Nine Months, which we've trademarked, is the name, and, and, and these are the sort of calls to action. So one in 12, one in 12 babies is born preterm. Make nine months last a lifetime. This one I thought would never get past the editor. Turns out length is important. We're talking about the cervix. I think the editor didn't read it striving to lower early preterm birth rates. So that was, the, that was the sort of thing that would appear in the newspaper. And then we put out, oh, it began, I wrote, I wrote a personal letter to all, uh, to all doctors in Western Australia and healthcare centres, and we sent out information booklets. And then we put out these magazines, 16-page magazines, through, which send out 160,000 at a time through the West Australian newspaper. And we've done it at about February or March of each of the three years we've been doing it. And we also have a hashtag and Facebook and all that sort of stuff, which I don't really know, but we've got people who run. We had a big outreach program, which we ran primarily during 2015. Doctors don't read anything you send to them. You've got to go and talk to them. So we, uh, we would do multiple trips out to the regions of Perth or out to the country areas of Western Australia. And we, uh, with a little team of myself and an obstetrician, a female obstetrician, called Suzanne Mahari, one of our specialty preterm birth prevention midwives and our chief sonographer, Michelle Pedretti, who's just been named Australian Sonographer of the Year. Uh, we travelled the, we travelled the whole state and we, we did about 13,500 kilometres over a period of a year or so and we ran evening workshops making sure that everybody had access to all this information. You write to people, they're not going to read it, but if you go to their country town and, and put on an evening workshop, uh, they, they will come. So what happened? Well, we published the results of the first full, month, full, full calendar year, first 12 months of this uh, in May of this year. This was the report of major impact, the lead article in the American Journal of ONG in May of this year. 
uh, showing the outcomes of, of what happened in the first full year of running the program. So in that year, what actually happened? Well, this is the rate of preterm birth in Western Australia, and th these are run charts. From now on, you'll be seeing run charts, which are how these data are meant to be presented. So this is the median, or this red line is the median of the preceding years, and these are, these are two-month epochs uh, for the years. We started the initiative in about mid-2014, to cut a long story short, actually it was May 2014, uh, and these are the preceding years, and the rate of preterm birth in Western Australia fell by 7.6%. And on a run chart, you look at the epochs, and if there are six below or, be or above the line, that's the equivalent of being statistically significant. So by whatever measure of statistical significance you use, the rate of preterm birth across Western Australia fell in the first full calendar year after this initiative. What, what happened at the different gestational ages? Well, of course, most preterm births are in, the, are in the 32 to 36 week group. That's where the big numbers are. And you can see the effect here is, is similar. The effect also occurred, was significant at the 28 to 31 week age group. And this, in the 20 to 27 week group, it fell, but tests of statistical significance were not significant, but the numbers were much smaller. But we interpreted this to, to mean that the, the effect had fallen at the earlier gestational ages. Now, people in the United States have run programs amongst groups of hospitals to lower the rate of late preterm birth, but no one's lowered it across the full gestational age spectrum before. So what, what was working? Well, we haven't done the full phenotype yet. We, we're going to do it next year. But, but this, is, th this could only be prevention of late preterm birth acting immediately. The effect was virtually immediate. So it couldn't have been a mid-pregnancy intervention that's acting here. It must have been discouraging women and their obstetricians from early delivery, but this effect here could not have been that. This, this early gestational age, this was probably mid-pregnancy scanning and progesterone. What happened in King Edward? Well, in, in the major centre, the effect was even greater and was immediate. So you can see here the effect, and you can see the rate of preterm birth, which is about 20% in our hospital, because it's the referral centre for, for preterm births in Western Australia, uh, fell by 20% in the first year. Uh, what, if you look at the different gestational age groups, it's very similar in King Edward as opposed to the rest of the state. So where did these preterm births go? Well, they, they went into the 39-week age group. So if you look at the bottom left panel here, this is the 39-weekers, you can see here a, a very statistically significant increase in births in the 39-week age group and to a lesser extent in the 37-week group. So even though we compromised by saying 38 and a half weeks, not 39 weeks, the births appeared at 39 weeks. The reason we did it was the AMA in Western Australia said they would not endorse this if we said 39, because too many obstetricians have to get out of bed at night if you push them all to 39. So we agreed on 38 and a half in a negotiating session, but the net result was the same. We, 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 we transferred them to the 39 week age group. So what does this, what does this play out to in the state of Western Australia with 34,000 births a year? It, play, it plays out, and this is, the, uh, this is calculation of the number of births averted. In that one year, in 12 months, we basically prevented 200 preterm births. And most importantly, in the early preterm birth group, about 47. Now, to, to be allowed to start this and to get funding to run the new clinic required a business case to go to the Minister for Health, which we did in great detail. And that business case said that we would pay for the entire program for the year if we prevented the early birth of two or three preterm births. That's all we re were, were required to, to make it a cost-effective exercise, and we prevented about 47. So it's cost-effective by whatever means you wish to look at it. So where to from here? Well, we're obviously interested in, 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 in dissecting out further what's happened. We have to dissect out what's happened in the time since then, and we won't get the full 2016 data until February of next year. We also have a lot of questions to do about regions, phenotype, private versus public, etc. We also have an interest in expanding this into Eastern Australia, and we've started in, in, in th those steps right now and several places overseas are also interested in adopting the whole nine months, and we're discussing that. This is from the Northern Territory. This is the Northern Territory newspaper. There's a lot of interest. How do you increase the effect? Well, it was 7.6% reduction. Uh, the 
press release went out on the Wednesday morning to the minister. His press release in the afternoon said an 8% reduction. Channel 7 News that night said it had been a 10% reduction. And by breakfast television the next morning, Koshi on Sunrise said that 200 babies had been prevented from dying in Western Australia due to this program. So the, the, the way to increase it is to send it off to the media. What, what else are we going to do? Well, we're interested in now look, going for the mid-hanging fruit. And where is the mid-hanging fruit? Well, infection is the next area. And this is to introduce Jeff Keelan's talk, which will be the last talk of this section, talking about what we're doing with infection. There are other areas. What about the high-hanging fruit? What happens when we get higher? Well, we have this incredible phenomenon in Western Australia that since the 1970s, we have not had flying squads go out to pick up women in preterm labour. Everybody's put in little aeroplanes. Somewhere between five and 7,000 women have been transferred in Western Australia since the 1970s in little aeroplanes to King Edward. Not one has delivered in the air. So women leave up to eight centimetres from 2,000 kilometres away. They do not deliver in the air. They never deliver in the air. And we're trying to work out why. But there's a big lesson there. We're also very interested in populations in transition. And we've done a lot of work in China looking at Chinese preterm birth rates, which have always been known to be very low. But what happens to Chinese women when they move from traditional Chinese society into our Western society? So the preterm birth rate in China sits at about 3%. And the one good database is in Jiangsu province. It's the only ultrasound data database there is. Uh, and their preterm birth rate is 2.6 to 2.9. When women move into Hong Kong, when they're non-resident, it goes to 5. When they're resident, it goes up. Chinese-born women in Western Australia have a preterm birth rate of 4.4%. But if you look at it as they change, you can see that the preterm birth rate in China of about 3% is the, is, is the same as the preterm birth rate of Chinese women in Western Australia who need an interpreter. In other words, they've recently arrived. When they can speak English, their preterm birth rate doubles to be about the same as a non-resident Chinese woman in Hong Kong, and then it goes up. So as you move societies, as your environment changes, your preterm birth rate goes up. What goes up can come down, and herein lie major opportunities for us. But we will never be able to prevent all preterm births so we're, looking, we're very interested in finding an alternative to delivering 22-week, 23-week babies and putting them onto a ventilator, which is clearly not a good thing to do. So in partnership with, with Toyuka University in Sendai in Japan, we have a very big program running looking at the artificial placenta and the artificial womb. There are two groups in the world who are working on this in, in collaboration or competition, whichever way you want to look at it, Philadelphia, uh, and us with the Japanese, and this is taken on the, on, in our building on the university campus here, looking at delivering very preterm lambs and putting them underwater using their own heart as their pump, uh, and we can safely keep these babies undamaged without metabolic acidosis uh, for a week. Next year we go to two weeks, and after that we go to four weeks. It's got a long way to go. I've got many, many people in our preterm birth team who, who, who do far more of the work than I do, who I wish I had more time to acknowledge. But I just want to end with this. Will this tree give us all we need? Well, you all know the famous paper in Science about 18 months ago showing that 60% that of cancer is just bad luck. The risk factors only account for 40%. And that's the same with preterm birth. It's about two-thirds of preterm births are completely unexplained. We may have treatments that are starting to work, but we don't understand the mechanism. So for those young people in this room who are looking for a field to work, we need to start digging further into the ground if we understand the true origins of much of this preterm birth and how we're going to lower the rate below 7.6% from where we are now. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, um, and congratulations on that really extraordinary uh, benefit of, of your intervention. It's incredibly impressive and for such an important area of our research, very exciting to see that progress. Now, we have four speakers in this session, so we've decided to give them all the 25-minute slot and then to draw them up at the end of the session for a panel discussion. So we're going to move right on now to our second speaker, who's Professor Michael Davies, Master of Public Health and PhD. 
an epidemiologist located in the Robinson Research Institute in the University of Adelaide. His research focuses on the social and biological pathways to health at different points in the life course, commencing with the question uh, of very uh, early events in life and how the periconception and pregnancy related factors alter our life over the course of, of our life course trajectory. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm not sure who's the braver, the conference organisers or me for coming. Mm -hmm. So, epidemiology. Um, firstly, I'd like to uh, thank my research group, thank the conference organisers for the invitation. It's great fun being here. A little bit about the group, just 30 seconds on us. It was a multidisciplinary group of, of epidemiologists, of um, medical anthropologists through to biostatisticians. We have an interest in uh, some of the, the interaction of social and biological pathways, how social structure impacts on some of the decision making, such as the third age of childbearing, how that in turn uh, also becomes literally embodied uh, in the creation of social disadvantages that are then transferred from one generation to the next. We see it every day, uh, but we have uh, not a detailed theoretical understanding of how this can be tackled from within reproductive epidemiology. So we have particular expertise in cohort studies, uh, and in data linkage to try and bring together some data sets that we can use for looking at some of these questions. So today, it's, it's a new sort of topic where I was trying to get a, a, a spin on the 21st century technologies. And John's, John's given a fabulous introduction there about how an emerging technology can actually alter uh, a, a very significant parameter that influences subsequent uh, health. So sort of four questions today. What maternally mediated factors influence poor uh, perinatal outcomes? Uh, is there, uh, do we have some evidence of programming of the reproductive axis as a result of some upstream factors that can be altered by social circumstance? And when fertility fails in the 21st century, uh, what do we rely upon and really how, uh, how safe and effective is it? Uh, but then also, is there some curious uh, potential benefit from some of it? And then finally, can we actually look at some of these uh, infertility treatment, for example, as a natural experiment to learn something about uh, the interaction of social and biological pathways. So how can we actually make a testable hypothesis about this? And I've, I've been rather uh, uh, drawn to life history theory, a sort of generalizable model that with reproductive strategies across different species, there's sort of three broad components of investment in terms of how much effort it is to enter into a reproductive act, uh, how much investment is, the, is there in the pregnancy itself, and John's indicated uh, that, that there can be variable amounts of investment with very important consequences for offspring. And then finally, the postnatal weaning. And I've, I've flagged here that perinatal death is actually a very interesting uh, uh, area of investment as kind of an outcome uh, uh, of, of the uh, early, uh, early life investment, which has changed extraordinarily in the 20th, 19th, 20th and 21st century. And Australia lives in an extraordinarily a uh, privileged place where our perinatal death rates are amongst the lowest, absolute lowest in the world, as are maternal death rates. So uh, many of you work in a lab, and of course the, the mouse is a very nice example of a, of a very low investment uh, strategy because it's going to have a very short life, so it doesn't invest much in the pregnancy, uh, delivers immature young very early, gets back in the mating very fast, and it's accompanied by very high perinatal death rates. Uh, so by contrast, we're quite a different strategy, and so we can actually... Uh, and so while people are bemoaning the reduction in family sizes and the 28-year-old kids living at home, uh, those kids are probably going to live to be 100 uh, because they're getting such an enormous investment in them. Uh, so we can actually uh, relate something as simple as uh, uh, perinatal death rates and, pr and project the, f the future longevity of the population in Australia. And this has actually been done before. So many of you will recognise this is, this is one, of, uh, one of the maps that was used uh, by the Barker group in trying to estimate the relationship between birth weight and cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is the, the UK uh, distribution of cardiovascular disease. Red's bad, green is good. And so what, uh, now 30 years ago, uh, 31 years ago, Barker and Osborne uh, produced this neat little scattergram, which is really just of perinatal death rates and death rates from cardiovascular disease 60 years later and generated the perfect image that fits into life history theory. Um, the, this is mere ecological data and is considered very poor, but they have then since gone on to uh, replicate this elsewhere. But what they also proposed was that this was a mechanism uh, by which social deprivation was being perpetuated. 
Uh, and in, uh, the, 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 the mediating factor in this argument was that it was maternally mediated diet altering fetal development that was then flowing on to the next generation. Now what we are aware of is that there's a multitude uh, of other potential factors that can operate uh, at different critical periods. Uh, this is firstly, it was replicated in, in many different cohort studies and, and so we, we're all happy that it's a fairly robust and stable effect. Um, now, even though the idea of critical periods is not new, Stockard, uh, Stockard uh, uh, developed this concept in 1921. However, if we apply it in the contemporary context, we can now see there is a, a, a multitude of questions around how we actually develop a theory about when do we measure what and when is it going to be critical and for whom. Um, now, when dealing with population cohorts, there's a neat way, there's a neat, neat way into this, which is particularly doing periods of sharp economic and social transition, we can actually parse different phases of life. We can actually, uh, for example, in the top here, oh good, it does work, wonderful. This is the effect of, of age on obesity. So you can actually see that, that, that obesity increases with, as we age, that's pretty standard, about a couple hundred grams a year in contemporary society, for example. However, it then goes over a cliff. Now then, partly that's due to two factors. <coughs> One is that the uh, people who are overweight and, uh, and obese aren't represented in the population anymore because they die more frequently. Secondly, however, is that the older population here, the oldest population, actually uh, survived a critical period that uh, for, for, there was a risk factor for obesity that their younger cohort uh, uh, members didn't survive. Now, and just to demonstrate that, there is a very interesting... Um, there's, there's also a secular gain here, which means that by year, everybody's getting fatter on average. However, on the far right here, it's extremely interesting that there's a dip showing that, in fact, it's the baby boomers, boomers who are at the greatest risk of, con uh, of developing obesity. That the cohorts born uh, since, the, 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 since the 1950s actually have a lower adult risk of, of developing obesity. It's really quite interesting. So, the, and some of you will understand the notion of washout. So at a population level, it is as though uh, the previous susceptible generation with the epidemic of heart disease is gradually fading out of the existing population and they're being replaced by people who are not as susceptible to the obesogenic environment. Now, this is incredibly important for developing human policy, but then also making projections about the longevity of the current, uh, of future cohorts of individuals. Now, it's also very useful, this strategy, of separating things into, into aging period and cohort effect is also very useful for identifying emerging vulnerable populations. For example, in this exact figure here, uh, we can act, it's a figure of, uh, uh, of uh, black and white Americans. This is taken from a US paper. And the real alarm here is that amongst young black women, they're going through a stratospheric uh, increase in the prevalence of obesity in, in America. So they constitute a, a very, very special target group. By contrast, the, uh, the, 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 both the white, and the, the white and the black male peers in particular go through a much shallower curve. Now I should flag that unlike most demographic characteristics, this is in turn also rather more complicated because we've actually got within a single individual multiple generations, uh, multiple cohorts acting at once and multiple factors. So the, 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 the cell that became us was in fact nurtured directly by our mother, uh, by our grandmother in the creation of, of our mother's ovary from which, you know, the egg uh, emerged that gave birth to us. So in fact, we've simultaneously got um, uh, three cohort effects and, and three period effects and, and really this is a, a very complex uh, uh, thing to, for people to argue about. Now, what I might do now is simply step through briefly um, uh, three cohort studies trying to illustrate how we can try and compress the time scale uh, of, of some of these events. Ideally, we would start developing cohort studies that simply run for 60, 80 years, but none of us are going to live long enough. Uh, so we can actually do some tricky stuff uh, called a synthetic cohort analysis where we grab young children at one age, make an observation, and then you grab another cohort from a similar or comp comparable population at another age and then project forward in time. So you get overlapping age bands to see what the, what the future is going to hold for us. So there's uh, the Generation 1 cohort, a prospective birth cohort um, in South Australia, uh, the Lucina cohort, which is sort of like a three-generation study of, of programming of the reproductive axis with the focus on PCOS, and then the South Australian birth cohort. Generation 1, it was set up straight up as a programming 
uh, as testing the bark hypothesis, but we examined diet at two points in pregnancy, not one, because we thought there'd be an early effect, and there was. We were able to show that early, uh, early protein carbohydrate balance in the first trimester was what was the driver of birth weight and chondral index, not the third. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, we had serial measurements. We, we had really uh, multiple, like the RAIN study, had multiple uh, serial observations uh, of these kids now out to uh, nine years of age. And what we were able to find was that firstly, we can now identify discrete growth trajectories uh, in the children, not just during fetal life, but then also postnatally that predisposed them to obesity. And these growth trajectories, is a little bit of crossing, but in fact, the, the catch up, so called catch up period is very narrow, only in the first six months and then the kids settle in a pretty stable uh, 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 trajectories. What we found was that uh, the, the kids on the high growth trajectory um, or the increasing growth trajectory were the ones that were at particular increased risk of obesity at age nine. And the biggest driver of being on that trajectory was actually maternal body composition uh, in the first trimester around the time of conception. So this is really quite interesting evidence to suggest that we are actually in the midst of a transgenerational amplification of obesity. Uh, at least in Australia, and it's going to be, and, and potentially other countries as well. Now, we then went on, uh, and we actually looked then at uh, insulin uh, resistance in the kids, and then found again that, in fact, there's an independent contribution of maternal body composition at conception. So the increase in body size is actually uh, through technological and, and food and nutrition transition and social transition is going to be a major driver both of patterns of fetal development and chronic disease risk in the future. Uh, particularly, as I've demonstrated, in amongst, for example, um, uh, young black American women. The second cohort I refer to is the Lucina cohort. These are, uh, we basically went back to a hospital and extracted all female records that survived the discharge in the mid-70s and then found them again after 30 years and enrolled them into a cohort study. Uh, we were interested in, in the, uh, how obstetric factors and, and pregnancy conditions uh, increase, uh, were related to programming of the reproductive axis and particularly PCOS. So there were some thousands in this, and we found them, you know, 30 years. It's Adelaide. You, about 50% were in the white pages after 30 years. So it wasn't... A, the other 50% were a bit tougher. Though. And so what we have is, a, 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 the, in the blue band, uh, the live cohort of around 1,000 women. We then have both family reports and medical reports on the history of, of the parental background, and then we have reports of their own, um, uh, not just their pregnancies, but then also any reproductive disorders. And we've discovered that, in fact, Firstly, the prevalence of PCOS is remarkably high. Uh, it's up uh, with Rotterdam criteria, it's 18%, and under NIH uh, conditions, it's 8%. There had never been a prevalence estimate done before in a representative sample, as just remarkably. But we also found that about a quarter of the women by the age of 30 actually had real concerns about the fertility, and 10% had already been uh, to see a physician, and 4% uh, and of them are now off uh, giving birth uh, through IVF. Uh, with nearly a comparable amount through ovulation induction. But what we did find was that um, if we go back to the previous cohort of the Generation 1 cohort, we had the high trajectory babies. Now, those high birth weight babies, if you project forward 30 years, what we have found in the Lucina cohort is that they, in fact, tend to have hyperandrogenism as an isolated symptom. Have, by contrast, uh, those babies with a low pondral index of birth uh, in, uh, it looked like the traditional thrifty phenotype that, that the Barker group talks about, and they in turn are, are more predisposed to having the full-blown PCOS symptom of metabolic disorder, derangement, and uh, insulin uh, resistance, and, and ovulatory infertility. Now, the final cohort they refer to is the South Australian birth cohort. This is a whole of population cohort in South Australia. It's, about, it's roughly 320,000 births at the moment. Um, it's a whole perinatal collection linked to all of the birth defects registry, and sitting behind that are all cycles of assisted conception uh, for the entire state over a 17 year period between January 86 and December 2002. I want another 10 years of data, but um, uh, funding bodies just think this is, is, is all been done. However, the entire um, uh, landscape has shifted in this area, and we have no surveillance system on this at all at the moment uh, with regards to adverse outcomes. There's no systematic process. Now, what we were trying to do is, is really separate the sources of risk and identify modifiable sources of risk, both in terms of you know, uh, the treatment strategy, like multiple embryo transfer, but then also the specific, specific interventions, IVF versus ICSI and cryo versus fresh and so on. And we had a series of questions. I, I'm afraid I don't have time to read them all, but we actually addressed all of these questions in a single 
studies, uh, trotted through them, um, and what we were able to do was, this is just the design, we hooked up all of the ART data uh, to the perinatal collection, 302,000 births, uh, there was the population prevalence of birth defects was 5.8%. It was elevated about 8.5% um, in the uh, ART group. Uh, we were able to examine all of every combination, every uh, individual treatment and combination of treatments that was uh, available uh, at the time. And we had actually, unlike many of the studies that were done internationally, we had pretty good uh, control over confounding factors. Uh, and that came in handy. All the data were coded to ICD-9. I shan't read that out for you, but it's uh, down to four-digit code there. However, I will show you this very briefly, which is that we were able to replicate um, Michelle Hansen's, uh, uh, this is actually in the, in the middle of Michelle Hansen uh, meta-analysis on, on IVF and birth defects. It sits right in the middle, which is a nice place to be in a systematic review, I've got to say. Uh, so uh, an overall odds ratio of 1.3 for any birth defect uh, with any, any, any treatment. Uh, that jumped around uh, substantially depending on whether it was a fresh or frozen or an, or an ICSI cycle. Uh, the worst fresh cycle was, was ICSI at 9.9% major birth defects. I should say these are followed out to five years of age. And if you only go to birth, then you miss half of them, basically. So it's important to actually have the longer follow-up and then you also pick up the cardiac defects, which seem to be a real target for some of these interventions. Uh, down the bottom, we also found that there was an increased risk of people um, with a background of infertility, um, and where they had been uh, given ovulation induction alone outside of the clinic. Now, even the people with a background of infertility, in fact, uh, we now know that they've been uh, given ovulation induction drugs, but not through a supervised channel uh, with the IVF clinic, and that carries a, a separate independent risk. Now, in terms of procedures, this uh, very briefly summarises uh, the, uh, the, the res that result. On the top, uh, uh, there's IVF, and we actually found that in between the adjusted and unadjusted, we can actually explain away the excess risk of birth defects uh, in IVF uh, pretty much entirely through maternal factors and conditions in pregnancy. Now, that's good for understanding the etiology, but it actually doesn't change the burden of, uh, the, the, the burden of ill health that's then passed on to uh, the hospital subsequently. Uh, the worst risk was actually for clomiphene citrate at home, where there some people were simply told to go home with this drug. Uh, however, ovulation induction inside the clinic appeared to be pretty good. Um, there's a paper tomorrow on, on clomiphene citrate, and I refer you to that, so I shan't dwell on it here. We then moved on to look at the perinatal outcomes. And we considered all of these outcomes, and in one way or another, every single one of these is worse in the ART group. Not a single one is better, uh, which is a, 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 bit of a, a bit of a litany of woe. We can summarise uh, some of that here, uh, and then, of course, the, what we then observed was the ovulation induction that was outside the clinic had the worst outcomes of anything. So, in fact, if you've got infertility and you want to get decent treatment, then an IVF clinic is probably the best place for you, rather than relying on, on uh, ovulation induction drugs over the web, uh, which was associated, you know, well, poorly supervised uh, ovulation induction was associated with fourfold increased risk of stillbirth, sevenfold increase in neonatal death. Now, the final point is, can we actually learn something from this litany of woe. Um, some, people, some people actually argue that, of course, you're going to see more increased uh, adverse outcomes because uh, you're treating older women. So we actually went and tested it. And we actually found that, the, that the, the pattern of birth defects that we see in women going through assisted conception don't match uh, what we see in the general population. Um, now, a little bit about uh, fecundity firstly. Uh, it's extremely difficult to actually look at this, uh, study this as an epidemiologist, because you can't hang around watching people having sex and verifying it. Um, uh, so we rely on the historical cohorts for, for trying to extrapolate this from the Hutterites and other groups that were non-concepting and, and trying to uh, conceive. And there seems as though this is, uh, there's an inflection point around the age of 35 to 37, which many of you know about. And then it's basically a, a straight line decline 10% percentage points a year between 35 and 45 in terms of the chance of conceiving. Now, interestingly, that chance of live birth uh, is argued to be made up of, of not just chance of fertilisation, but it's actually made up of increased rates of aneuploidy and increased pregnancy loss up to the age of 40, So, which is an interest, interesting argument. Now, what we found in our data was that, in fact, we, on the left-hand column, we could replicate the increased rates of birth defect across five-year age bands or uh, uh, across age bands in the general population 
where it increases from 5.6 up to 8.2 percent. Okay, that's fair enough. However, what we found uh, in, in both the IVF and uh, ICSI, the, the direction is actually reversed. And when you pull them together, the group with the absolute lowest risk of, of any birth defect are the women over 40 who have a live birth, and they're remarkably healthy. And what we also discovered was it's not due to terminations for defect, because the terminations are also low. Uh, there's, uh, by contrast, the, the risks in young women uh, are really uh, alarmingly high, uh, pushing up over, over eight, nearly 9%. Uh, there's several uh, possible explanations for this. For the effect in the younger women, it could be that, that there is some strange cohort effect where these women have been exposed to something really unpleasant in the environment or in their occupation or something, or they've got an underlying disease. There could be some other confounding factor, but we don't know what it is and nobody else can think of it either. Or uh, in young women, it could be that they're actually over-responding. They've got a different etiology for the infertility and they're over-responding in some adverse way to, to the ovulation induction. In the older women, again, that could be, could it be survivorship of top quality follicles for these women, but why don't the, why don't the follicles survive in, in natural conceptions as well? Is it actually the loss of poor quality embryos? Well, it doesn't seem to be that. We can't see evidence of that. Or is it actually some other uh, miraculous restoration of central function that's controlling the, uh, the restoration of ovulation uh, and the resumption of meiosis in these women, reducing the risk of aneuploidy? Well, there's actually some evidence to support this um, uh, because you can do reciprocal ovarian transplants and in two different species. One's, one's actually um, uh, looked at a senescent model uh, in, the, in the lethal yellow agouti and then found that transplanting the old ovary into a young mouse extends the reproductive career of that ovary uh, back to normal or that of a young mouse. And conversely, somebody's developed a, 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 a model of congenital heart defects which increases dramatically with age and if you, if you gain to a reciprocal ovarian transplant and take the old ovary and put it in a young mouse, uh, it removes the increased risk of cardiac uh, defects in the offspring from that ovary. So it seems though it's biologically plausible that at least for certain outcomes, it's the age of the mother that's important, not the age of the ovary. And I'm wondering whether, there is the, whether there's a parallel opportunity for investigating something like that in humans. Okay, so where do we want to go from here? Well, we want more data because you know, the, the, whole, the whole landscape has changed. We want to get on top of these rapid changes. Uh, we want to do this again in, in other places with other cohorts and other populations. We want a further long-term follow-up of, of these populations. Uh, and, uh, and we have a grant at the moment looking at intellectual disability potentially. Um, we also want to link the mother's well-being, and we've actually already got permission to link uh, uh, some drugs from the PBS uh, to the pregnancy outcomes, because at the moment, none of the drugs in the PBS are tested on pregnant women, none of them are tested on human embryos, and we have this really, uh, we have a blind loop that's not going anywhere between the adverse reporting system and, and prescribing patterns. We really, we could have that happen in real time these days, and that's going to be a really important challenge. And then finally, you know, we want to link to other, other you know, outcomes of interest that are 20th century uh, uh, epidemics, uh, and we want to collaborate in mechanistic studies because there's stuff that you do that we can't, we can never do. So with that, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Michael, for that very compelling uh, story I think of the critical importance of the environment in which we're conceived and how that has such a major impact over the life course and also reminding us of our responsibility I think to really understand the um, imperative to be safe in the work that we do and to understand the impact of the fantastic new technologies that the 21st century has brought us. All right so for our third speaker we have Associate Professor Jacqueline Boyle. Jackie's an obstetrician gynaecologist and deputy director at the Monash Centre for Health Research and Implementation at Monash University. Her work is focused on public health research in reproductive health and health services, particularly aiming to improve health outcomes for those who experience inequity in health provision and promotion, health care and uh, environments of supporting positive health uh, behaviours. So Jackie will speak to us about before, between and beyond pregnancy, optimising reproductive health for all.
Thanks very much. So um, I've kind of changed the... I know the session was about babies, birth and beyond, and I'm kind of taking a step back and saying that we need to look at before, between and beyond pregnancy because we really need to look at optimising reproductive health across the life course, which Michael has really made a very good case for. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I am um, talking about women today, not that I don't think men are important. We know that the reproductive health of men is important for them, but also for um, babies and for intergenerational health. But, and I have three boys, so um, I do think it's important, but it's certainly not my area of expertise. Um, so, it's a picture of the life course. I'm feeling a bit like the little old lady on the end today because I was at a 21st last night and I was dancing with a whole lot of young things and I think I've skipped one or two <laughs> and really feeling my age today. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners and pay my respects to elders past, um, present and emerging. So, I'm going to talk about sexual and reproductive health, why it's important, how do we improve it, what some of the barriers are, some, and I'm going to just talk about some of the research that um, our team has been doing on um, three areas across the life course, so pregnancy planning and preconception health, weight gain prevention and polycystic ovary syndrome and our group does quite a bit of work um, interlinked with Michael's around that area. Um, and also um, around What's the role of having a reproductive life plan? So sexual and reproductive health means that people are able to have a responsible, satisfying and safe sex life, the capability to reproduce and the freedom to decide if, when and how often that they want to do this. And to enable this we need implementation of education that reaches everyone and we also need access to affordable sexual and reproductive medicine for everyone. And that includes safe, effective, affordable and acceptable methods of birth control. And we need to facilitate environments in healthcare that support individuals to reduce their risk and to promote healthy lifestyles so they can maximise their reproductive health and their overall health. So I don't really need to talk about this because Michael did such a beautiful job about how we can improve the health of men and women themselves across the lifespan, impact the health of their gametes and the intrauterine environment, pregnancy outcomes, and really importantly, that intergenerational health. And I think that we need to, there's, there's three main areas where it can work. So we need to look at preventive health, we need to look at preconception, and we also need to look at contraception. And those will all be important at different phases in people's lives. So some of the barriers that women have um, reported that they experience uh, in, in sexual and reproductive health is around health services. So do they actually exist where they live? What's the cost of it? Do they have access to a trusted healthcare provider? Do they provide culturally appropriate care? Um, is it youth friendly, for example? In rural areas, they experience a lot of issues with shame and embarrassment. Um, and is there flexibility? So young people in particular often prefer having drop-ins um, rather than appointments, for example. Women also report that they don't really understand what, prim what the role of primary health care is when it comes to things around preventive care um, or preconception care. Um, they'll go for a contraception or a pap smear, but don't really think that it's necessarily a GP's role or health primary health care's role to talk to them and they don't want to waste their time. Health literacy is really important, so their knowledge of how important all of this stuff is for their health and for the health of any future babies. Um, people think that, you know, having a baby naturally is quite normal and do they actually need to think about it or plan for it? There's also issues around um, culture, so for some family planning is not really appropriate. Um, and also attitudes. So a lot of women are quite ambivalent often when it comes to their reproductive health or planning a pregnancy. And women with, for example, chronic disease are often quite fearful of discussing pregnancy planning and their reproductive and preconception health because it's quite scary often what they're actually being asked to do. Health providers um, also experience barriers. So again, some of them think that it's outside their role. Um, and in, in terms of service design, um, they often, it's often expensive 
for women. They feel that the health providers have competing priorities and short consultation times which don't really facilitate a discussion around reproductive health or um, beyond contraception and pap smears. They also um, find it difficult often because they don't have um, enough resources both to themselves, um, such as checklists, or also for women, and particularly for women who, who don't have a lot of health literacy or knowledge around areas, it's very difficult when you st to, to start those conversations. Um, and again, they're often a bit scared about talking to women because how do you, they don't want to alienate women and disengage them from healthcare when they start talking about um, obesity, for example, and smoking. So the things that we need to do to support sexual and reproductive health include education and engagement of community and health providers, access to care, supportive systems to help healthcare providers and community when need guidelines and implementation, make it easy for those to be implemented. And we need some of those overarching principles of community input because that's why things often don't work because we don't really engage with community to work out what they want and why they want it and how. And we need to remember the social determinants of health. There's a really good book there if anyone is interested around um, social determinants of Indigenous health. And we have those, those layers around us um, of in, that affect our health, so the individual lifestyle, our social and community networks, as well as that broader socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental conditions. And we need to always remember to have that health equity lens because we can't just treat everyone the same because not everyone starts with the same opportunities. And I think importantly, we need a life course approach. Ooh. So I'm going to talk um, about three areas where we've been working around doing that. So one is around pregnancy planning and preconception health. So it's really important. So pregnancy planning, we know that 50 to 70% um, of women plan their pregnancy and then there's a number that are completely unplanned and some that are unintended. We also know that about half of those women are using contraception, about a quarter of them are using the pill. But we know that when women have to make daily decisions about their contraception, they're much more likely to have an unplanned pregnancy. Um, we also know that they don't tend to um, take up uh, pap smears, we know that um, about 50 to 78 per cent of women are having cervical screening and that that's also decreased in certain groups such as those um, in lower socioeconomic groups and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and women in rural and remote areas. If we're going to look at impacting on things like um, obesity and smoking and if we can and women who for example do have issues with fertility such as PCOS it's really important to diagnose those early and to have those conversations early. So some of the um, work that we're doing is looking at, um, in Australia, the London measure of unplanned pregnancy. This is a tool that was developed in at the University College of London and it's six questions. Um, and it's been validated for use in a number of um, countries and continents. And we're doing a validation of that in the Australian context and piloting its use um, in routine maternity care because if you're going to look at implementing health promotion around preconception and pregnancy planning you need to be able to measure your impact in some way so if it was a tool that's quite easy to use in routine maternity care then that would be one way to monitor that. We're also doing a survey of um, pregnancy planning, preconception health knowledge and behaviour and health provider interactions in women who are giving birth at Monash Health over 12 months and Monash has a really diverse um, group of women who birth, give birth there. Um, about 60% are born overseas. And the question's been developed with international colleagues based on previous validated tools. So we're hoping to compare our findings with what they've um, reported. Um, and that's currently being administered. And we're also undertaking interviews and focus groups with women from um, a number of groups in Melbourne, but including those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And overarching with all of this, we have community advisory groups which are helping us from the very conception of the research and following it right through. We've also had a really, um, a quite an exciting um, partnership that's happened with Medibank Private. Um, so you would think that you, capture, you are capturing um, a group of women that are probably of the higher socioeconomic status group, but about half of women actually do take out private health insurance before they're planning a pregnancy. So it's really, and it's quite hard to actually reach women 
um, and find out what they're thinking when they're actually planning a pregnancy. So they're kind of a group that are um, it's going to be really um, good for us to, to talk with and to work with. We're also, um, if you look at obesity and across the life course, so Michael's really talked about that um, quite a bit and it, it's very difficult again once you come into pregnancy um, if your BMI is overweight or obese to do very much about it. You can work at limiting gestational weight gain but really ideally we should be working with women before that happens. So we've had a program called the Healthy Lifestyle for Women program and it's worked across a number of target groups, target settings um, and across policy and strategies. And the Australian Longitudinal Women's Health Study has reported that women put on around 700 grams per year, which doesn't sound like a lot until you think about it, what that means over 10 years. And women also report that they retain about two to three kilograms of weight after each pregnancy. Um, and that's higher in women who have a gestational weight gain which is higher than the recommended international guidelines. So they're kind of areas where we've been um, focusing on. So the first place that this was tried, it, it's um, a social cognitive approach and it basically helps, it's not proscriptive, it talks to women about what they currently do with their exercise and diet and lifestyle and looks at making small achievable changes and you monitor them. Um, and if it hasn't worked, look at why not and perhaps even make different goals. And so the first time that this was tried, we, um, Kate Lombard, who developed this, recruited women through 12 primary schools. Um, who, so they were all women who had school-aged children um, and they were either given an intervention or, a, um, or were just given, or the control group were given a just general information about um, health and diet. So the women who, the other women were given three um, uh, group sessions where they discussed lifestyle changes and then they were followed up with text messages every month over the course of the year. So the women who um, had the um, intervention, so had the um, group sessions and the texts, they had, there was a, they, had, they had a trend towards a decrease in weight and the women in the other group had a trend to an increase in weight. But that wasn't really, the aim wasn't really to lose weight, it was really about weight gain prevention. And there certainly was a difference in the two groups um, in the overall weight change. The secondary outcomes included women feeling um, better able to manage their, um, healthy, their healthy eating and physical activity. Um, and feeling more confident in controlling their weight. So again, it doesn't sound like a lot, but if you look at it on a po population-based level, it actually has, um, has the, uh, the potential to have quite a significant impact. The next place that this, was then, this approach was then undertaken was in pregnancy at Monash Health. So 228 women were recruited at their um, booking visit and they, had, um, they, they were given four one-on-one -on -one sessions um, around lifestyle uh, management. And there, were, again, was a decrease in gestational weight gain in the women that received that extra advice um, compared with the women who just got the routine advice. Uh, and the, the benefit, interestingly, was um, mostly in women who were overweight rather than women who started with a BMI greater than 35. And it's probably because it's just much harder for them and they need much more intensive intervention. But the really, the interesting one was that it was actually also more beneficial for women from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. And we think that some of that was because women would come in saying that their mother or their mother-in-law had told them that they needed to do this particular thing or eat this particular thing in pregnancy or that they couldn't exercise. Um, and there were a lot of cultural beliefs and they often felt that they had the power to say, actually, it's okay for me to do this, um, having attended those sessions. And it's now, this program has now been adapted and implemented into what we're calling the Healthy Lifestyle Clinic in routine antenatal care, care at Monash Health. So women who have a BMI of greater than 30 kilograms per metre squared uh, either come to the Healthy Lifestyle Clinic or they'll go to routine care and they see an endocrinologist and a health coach in routine care 
and so that's that's a cost neutral um, approach um, that we're managing to implement that um, so that will that's currently about to be evaluated both in terms of any difference in um, weight gain and also how women have found the process and how the staff have found it as well. It was a bit tricky to implement at first, um, but certainly from the staff point of view, it's become much easier as time's gone on. And then finally, there's, it's been approached um, in rural communities. So the research group did many, many hours in the car driving all around Victoria um, and recruited 649 women from 41 communities. So the communities were um, randomised, women in the communities were randomised to either get um, the support or not. Um, and again, there was a between, between group difference of um, not a large amount of weight, but enough that it does become significant over time. And there was quite broad reach across the towns. Um, women also reported that they thought it had a positive impact on health behaviours with the rest of their family. Um, and the retention rates at one year were at 76% and participants mostly said that they would um, recommend the program. So the other area that my group does a lot of work in is on polycystic ovary syndrome. So this is a syndrome that has, has had many different criteria over the years, but Currently, the one that most of us are working with is called the Rotterdam criteria, where you have two of three um, of these uh, features, either raised androgens or excess hair growth, so hyperandrogenism, or irregular cycles and not ovulating frequently, or at all, in fact, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. And it affects anywhere between 12 to 18% of women and is more common in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and is worse with obesity in terms of prevalence and also the features. That again has impacts across the life course. So for young women, they often present with irregular cycles, excess hair growth. There's an increase in anxiety, depression, body image disorders. Um, once you go into thinking about becoming pregnant, obviously that causes reduced fertility. Um, and in later in life, and in fact, even in women who aren't that old, uh, there's also increased risk in metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and possibly some cancers. And again, has impacts on um, both on the babies and then in the um, intergenerational. So with polycystic ovary syndrome, there are Many, there's been studies that report that women experience significant delays to diagnosis and often have an incorrect diagnosis. And that, that's been multifactorial. Some of it's been about changing diagnostic criteria and some of it is about lack of awareness um, and also about women presenting, uh, presenting late. But I think it really does, this one really highlights the importance of looking after women when they're young and helping them maximise their health. So 40, uh, of an international survey of about 1,500 women, about 45% said they'd seen three or more doctors before they got a diagnosis. Um, nearly a third had greater than two years to diagnosis. And only 35% were satisfied with the whole process, not surprisingly, given that. Um, and they also reported that most of them were dissatisfied or indifferent to the information that they ended up being given by their healthcare providers. So it's not really very good as a health healthcare provider. So some of the work that's been done is that national guidelines were developed and um, endorsed by the National Health and Medical Research Council in 2010. So these had quite clear diagnostic criteria, recommended screening for metabolic and mental health, um, management of infertility and recommendations for lifestyle management and prevention of weight gain. There's been huge amounts of translation and dissemination, just like John's work. So we've been up to Cape York and um, Roma and the middle of uh, New South Wales. I don't think we got over to Western Australia very much, though, I have to say. Um, and, so, and a lot of work with both healthcare providers and, um, and community. And in fact, there's now international guidelines that are in the process of being developed now, so updating these ones, but in, with an international context. So it definitely has um, the potential for significant impact. But really, with all of that other work that was done around women, 
we felt that it was really important to explore some of that a bit further. So we surveyed 249 women with PCOS in Australia um, the, from 18 to 45 years, but the majority were between 26 and 35. We, they were spread across metropolitan, rural and remote. The majority did have some post-school education. A small proportion were born overseas, but we did get a good response from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women of 4%. And uh, almost half had a diagnosis um, greater than five years and the remainder less than five years. So we asked them about different things and one of them, so one was about where they got the information and whether they were using electronic sources. And the other thing that we asked them was around something called a question prompt list, which is basically a list, um, has information, it has lists of questions that you can take to facilitate your interaction with your healthcare provider. So the majority by far said that they would really like to have a question prompt list and that they would be likely to use it. Um, we also then, so in terms of looking at developing one, we then ask them what they find difficult to talk to their health professionals about. So that would help inform what we then developed. So we then developed a question prompt list. So uh, it has a page about what it is, who it's for. We have quite a lot of um, information around where you can find information about PCOS because we don't want women just going in and asking their health provider everything. It gives them some evidence-based and good quality websites, for example, to look at before they um, go in. Um, and there's some advice about how to use it with your health provider. There's a contents page. Then there is actually a list of questions, which are some are general and some are um, more specific around different topic areas. And we've done focus groups with women who have really um, taken this on board. And there were some really lovely things that, um, that we actually weren't really expecting, where women have said that they found it quite empowering. Um, and one woman who said she'd had PCOS for over 10 years and there was stuff in there that she looked at and was like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know about that. So we've done some pilot testing with health providers, which is a bit challenging. I, I'm a health provider and I think I, I do find it a bit challenging sometimes when people walk in the room with their list of questions and this is even more formalised. Um, the women have um, really been quite positive so far. This has been with GPs. Um, and the GPs, surprisingly, who actually thought that, they, I think the main fear was that it would make the consultation too long, but women are really encouraged to look at what's affecting them right now, what are their main priorities now, which is obviously going to change across your life course. Um, and so actually they were surprised and said that actually it didn't really generally tend to make the consultation too long. So that's now um, being uh, trialled with uh, other health providers, gynaecologists, endocrinologists, and we'll be, um, we're going to be planning to do a randomised controlled trial at a PCOS clinic that's starting at Monash Health. The other thing that we've done is looked at supporting women's health needs around information. So that same, tri that same survey that we did was asking women about where they get their information um, and how they use it. Um, and most women, not surprisingly, said that they'd use electronic devices to find information or to manage their um, PCOS. Um, and for different things, so a lot of women are using fitness um, devices and things like that to monitor their physical activity and diet um, and also to track menstrual cycles is, was another quite common one. Most women said that they would like um, an app rather than a website and that they would really like a PCOS specific app if one was available. Um, and most of them had said that the main reason that they hadn't was that there wasn't one to meet their needs and we have reviewed the apps that are available and they're not very good quality um, and not very comprehensive so it's not surprising that they couldn't find one. So we've been having a lot of fun now developing an app for women with PCOS. So we have a draft that's now being piped, um, about to undergo uh, user testing um, and user experience testing. Uh, and then hoping to, then we'll be trialling that also at the clinic and then looking to launch that next year. But it's really great because it's quite interactive. So again, really looks at linking women in at what's important at different stages of their life. They can individualise it and um, mark which things are important to them at the time. And that means that they will get targeted information relating to what their needs are now. We've also been involved in some um, models of care with polycystic ovary syndrome. So there's been two in community settings, 
One is based at Melbourne um, in Jean Held, which has an endocrinologist and uh, a dietitian. And there was one in the Torres Strait that had a women's health nurse, a GP and a dietitian. And they both tend to use those principles again of that health care approach rather than the prescriptive dietary and physical activity advice. And as I said, there's one also about starting Melbourne, which again is also going to be uh, multidisciplinary. But in part of the evaluation that we did of the one in the Torres Strait, I think again it just highlights that issue that was, we've been talking about across the life course that time and again we hear from women with PCOS that you know we really need to inform high school girls about this so they can get diagnosed earlier and women who said if I was informed and had the knowledge earlier I could have made better life choices for, for one at that time if I dealt with PCOS back then my pregnancy journey would have been better so that was from someone who was undergoing IVF treatment. So in conclusion I think that everyone should have a reproductive life plan how do we go about that that's a little bit more tricky um, there are tools that have been used um, across, um, in, mostly in the United States. Um, but the main message is that we should be thinking about reproductive life plans with every woman, every time, and changing pregnancy from chance to choice. And just referring back to what I was saying earlier about the importance of men, it probably should really be every person, every time. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for those really important messages. Um, I'm particularly interested, and I think all of us would agree, how important it is that we tackle reproductive health over the life course, and the reproductive life planning message, I think, is, is really um, fantastic. So now we'll turn to our last speaker, and he is Professor Jeff Keelan, who is Head of Laboratories at the University of Western Australia's discipline of ONG at the King Edward Memorial Hospital. And at the hospital, he's Director of Clinical Research Governance, Deputy Director of the Women and Infants Research Foundation, Scientific Director of the Western Australian Preterm Birth Prevention Initiative, and Co-Chair of the Western Australian Microbiome Consortium. So, microbiome, fantastic. And his current research is centred on pharmacological treatments and new drugs for intraamniotic infection and preterm birth, placental health and dysfunction, and nanoparticles, and new approaches using them in drug delivery. So Jeff is going to talk to us about new pharmacological strategies for preventing preterm birth. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you to Kirsty and Brett for giving me this uh, invitation to present. It's very exciting to be here, uh, and I look forward to seeing it on social media very soon. Um, right, let me just get my read here. Right, okay. So as Sarah said, I used to be in the, in the School of Women's and Infants Health and now I'm in the Division of Obstetrics and, and Gynecology, or DOG, in the Dog House, in the HMS. And if you actually Google, just out of interest, if you Google DOG HMS, uh, this is what you get. This is a very cute <laughs> image. So, so John, uh, that's the new mascot for the, for the, for the division. And as John said, I'm going to uh, finish the talk we started with preterm birth, so I'm going to finish with preterm birth. Uh, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about, a little bit about the background and, and what we know. We've we'll spent uh, sort of 25 years kind of figuring out how infection and inflammation drives preterm birth. And then I'm going to talk about some exciting results we've got about how we can predict uh, who's going to deliver preterm because of infection and therefore do something about it. And then spend the rest of the talk talking about the anti-inflammatory approaches. Uh, that we've been working on. And I'm going to skip through a few slides because I told I've, I, I haven't got 25 minutes, I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to go a bit fast. Uh, this is a gestational age distribution of, of, of births across Australia, so you can see the definition of preterm birth before 37 weeks, and we're about 8.5%, and that rate's been pretty stable uh, for a long time, actually going up due to the late preterm births that, uh, that the preterm birth prevention initiative has actually managed to lower. Preterm birth is actually a syndrome. It's caused by multiple, uh, has multiple causes, um, many of which are listed here. And this is a diagram by Roberta Ramiro, who is the, is the guru in the field. Roberta is a fantastic fellow. He publishes 100 papers a year on, pre, on, on perinatal uh, research. So he's an amazing guy. And four, five of those papers were co-authored with me. Uh, and he actually read the papers and he worked on them. So he's, a, he's quite remarkable. Uh, I'm going to talk about infection, um, as I, I, I alluded at the start of the talk, 
Um, uh, but actually, uh, most, many of those causes on that slide there are actually uh, involve inflammation. And that last one, the unknown box on the right, that really should be um, non-infectious inflammation. And, and inflammation under, 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 underpinned, sorry? Yeah, they're all inflammation. Yeah, un inflammation underpins many, many, if not all of those causes. Okay, so just to give you a sort of a brief overview of, the, of what we know about how infection causes preterm birth. So firstly, uh, we get bacteria ascending through the cervix, penetrates the fetal membranes and starts to colonize the amniotic fluid and then will actually reinfect the membranes from the inside out and uh, trigger... Oh, so it looks like some of the anim animations haven't worked. Okay. Uh, that triggers a, a response, an immunological response that results in the production of prostaglandins and, uh, and other immunological factors that you can measure in preterm birth. Um, there are inflammatory cells and the glucose concentration of the amniotic fluid actually drops because of all the infection. Uh, there's enhanced expression of inflammatory genes in the fetal membranes. Um, there's collagenolysis, so that's degradation of the fetal membranes that allows the membranes, causes the membranes to rupture prematurely. Um, and there's neutrophils and other immunological cells coming into the fetal membranes to try and kill off the infection. Um, and when the, baby's, when the placenta's delivered, you can do histology, and the histologist will see that as something called chorioamnitis. So often chorioamnitis is, is diagnosed after delivery and is thought to basically be a correlate of an infective cause for preterm birth. Um, all those things can result in fetal sepsis and an inflammatory response in the fetus, which is very damaging and associated with a lot of morbidity and mortality, um, and of course uh, increased risk of preterm birth. Um, and there's some of the neonatal consequences of being born preterm. What we do know is that, that uh, it's very gestational age dependent. And so the earlier, pre the, earlier the baby is born, the more likely it is to be born uh, due to an infection. But we also know, and this is something that's been, when I first started in this, in this field, it was, it was sort of anecdotal, but we know very clearly now that also the rate of inflammation without infection is also very common. Uh, in the earlier preterm births, but it's but is a significant cause throughout all of all deliveries. So you can see this is again another piece of data from Roberto Romero, um, and you can see in the earlier gestations here, almost all of them have either infection or inflammation, and that's the infected group, and that's the uh, inflammation without infection group. And as you get later and just oh, the gestational age um, increases, the rates uh, decrease. So it's particularly important in terms of the etiology of the earliest babies, and of course they're the ones that are most sick, the most likely to die, to have serious morbidity that lasts a lifetime. Uh, and that's just illustrated in the next slide here, which shows again gestational age on the bottom, uh, and the rate of uh, intrauterine inflammation total, and the proportion that's caused by infection. And if you look at the um, uh, death and major, morbid, major disability rate. It, it, it's very, very high for the earliest babies and decreases precipitously towards the, the, to, to the, um, with gestational age after about 32 weeks. Um, and that's the proportion of all preterm births. So most babies are born late preterm and have low morbidity and mortality. Uh, the very sickest babies don't uh, have a very small proportion, maybe 1% uh, of all, all deliveries. Um, it's very important to realize that uh, this is a continuum. So you don't get suddenly an infection and delivery within the space of a few days. There's a wide variety of sort of scenarios depending on the nature of the organism, how it gets to be where, it's, where it is, the immunological response of the mother, the placenta and the baby, uh, and, the, uh, and, 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 uh, and other factors that, that modulate the progression of the, of the, uh, the syndrome, if you like. And that's shown on this slide here. And the sickest babies, the ones that are diagnosed with intrauterine infection and have fetal sepsis, are shown here at the, at the, sort of the end, the right-hand side of the time course. But you get chorionitis and signs of inflammation even quite early on. So depending on when the mother turns up at the, in, the pre, in preterm labor at the, at the clinic, depending on what you measure and how you measure, um, you're going to get maybe part, part of the solution, part of the answer, part of the, the diagnosis or not depending on whether you can measure inflammation, whether the bacteria has reached the amniotic fluid or not. Um, and this is all very hard to diagnose in real time when a, when a, a, a woman presents with preterm labor in a hospital. And this is important because uh, it, the, the, the ability to diagnose infection and diagnose inflammation, therefore, uh, is important information in, in prescribing the correct 
uh, treatment and, and deciding whether you need to give antibiotics or need to give an anti-inflammatory or you need to give both. And I would say um, because it's such an imprecise act in terms of the diagnosis, almost always in these scenarios we need to assume there's an infection, even the infection hasn't reached the analytic fluid yet, uh, and we also need to assume that there's inflammation. So both need to be targeted at the same time with an effective therapy. Right, so uh, we know quite a lot about the bacteria that cause uh, intrauterine inflammation. Um, there's a lot of them. Uh, some of them are associated with a, a, a dysbiotic syndrome called bacterial vaginosis, which a lot of people have written about and a lot of people have used as a sort of marker of risk of preterm birth. But actually the most common organism that causes preterm birth is in fact a thing called urea plasma. And uh, John's group has worked a lot in urea plasma in the sheep and a lot of other people have worked and shown very nicely that you can that it's a causal relationship. So urea, urea plasma infection in the amniotic cavity provokes a very robust uh, inflammatory response, and that's associated with preterm birth, increased rates of morbidity and mortality of the neonate, um, and is a definitely a significant problem. However, many women have, uh, and men in fact, have uh, urea plasma in the urotogenital tract, and most women who have urea plasma do not deliver preterm. Uh, these are rates, uh, these are the data here we published a little while ago from a cohort in uh, King Eddie's Hospital where we work. Uh, and um, hopefully you can see, I'm, the writing might be a little bit small, but they're all urea plasma rates here. Um, this is in the preterm group on the left, and on the right is the term group. And you can see that 85% of the preterm group and 45% of the term group had uh, urea plasma uh, present. It's called species here because there's two types of, two species of urea plasma. Uh, one called parvum and one called urealyticum. And in fact, we showed that in fact it's the uparvum that's much more likely to be associated with preterm birth than, uh, the, than the urealyticum. And in fact, uh, number six here, serovar um, six, is, is, is uh, very significantly increased in the preterm birth cohort as a, uh, compared to the term cohort. Now, this is important because up until very recently, no one's been able to measure the serovars. Um, there's, there's 14 of them, in case you're interested. Um, and most of the old studies just talk about urea plasma as if it was one species and one serovar. Um, so really they've missed out this sort of very important uh, mechanistic and, and correlative information. And we are really the first people to uh, have sort of mailed this and, and got some data on it. So our ultimate aim is to identify um, women who are at risk of microbial-driven preterm birth so we can give them the appropriate antibiotics and uh, do this diagnostic uh, in mid-pregnancy um, before the bacteria have had a chance to get through the cervix and colonize the anodic fluid and start growing and start the inflammatory response which we know causes damage to the fetus, particularly if it's long term. So we would aim to do this before 20 weeks because some antibiotic trials have shown that if you give the antibiotics to a high risk group before 20 weeks you can actually lower the rate of preterm birth. Um, so how do you predict, how do you identify women who are at risk? The, one of the best studies is this, this uh, study here from a guy uh, called Gilbert Donders in uh, for Belgium. And he did a large study looking at risk factors and particularly uh, uh, bacterial vaginosis, uh, the presence of my, I think called Mycoplasma hominis or Candida. And as you can see from the data there, the, the bacterial vaginosis, the odds ratio was about 2.5 and another kind of similar um, dysbiotic syndrome is called uh, aerobic vaginitis and that was about 3. So the, the risk, you know, in terms of risk profile, it's not particularly uh, useful. And also because most of the organisms that are present in, in bacterial vaginosis aren't actually the causes of organisms that, that, that cause preterm birth. Um, importantly, he didn't look at urea plasma parvum or its serovars. Um, there's a program, I'm just going to skip that slide, there's a program in uh, Austria where they actually did a similar screening program uh, before 20 weeks and then treated um, and as you can see there in the intervention group, uh, the, 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 per the orange bars, they significantly lowered the rate of preterm birth in women either with bacterial vaginosis or candida. Um, and um, if you, they didn't, they, uh, that was a randomized controlled trial. Then they rolled this out as a program and got even more significant results. So basically this shows that if you, do, if you screen and identify risk factors and treat with antibiotics or anti and antimicrobials, you can actually have a very significant impact on the rate of preterm birth. But the problem here is that they're using bacterial vaginosis, which is a very poor marker, and they're not really uh, capturing the, the urea plasma data, which are the, the, those are the real women at risk. So um, 
we have uh, conducted a trial in HMRC tr uh, study over the last couple of years, uh, recruiting a thousand women uh, at low risk and then doing uh, vaginal microbi microbial screening uh, before 20 weeks. And these are some of the data from our, tr our data so far. And you can see that uh, if you, uh, this is the, uh, a molecular basis of a molecular diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. Um, there's 9.1% uh, had a, had a uh, uh, were, were it, it, sorry, 9.1% were positive uh, and uh, 59 delivered preterm and only eight women w with, the, um, with, the, with the bacterial vaginosis were, were predicted by, uh, were, sorry, only eight women who delivered preterm were predicted by being positive for bacterial vaginosis. So we have developed a test based on uh, urea plasma serovirus and two other bacteria and I can't tell you what it is because it's being patented uh, but I can tell you what the results are uh, and you can see here that 157, we call it the glue test, so 157 patients out of 1,000 would be positive, uh, and 21 of the 69 women who deliver free term would be positive, uh, which is pretty good. But if you look at the gestational age of the women, you can see, and this is bacterial vaginosis compared with the glue test here. So the bacterial vaginosis de de um, detected these uh, preterm births here, and then none before 35 weeks whereas the glue test had double the, the detection rate of preterm birth, but detected nearly half of the women who delivered preterm before 35 weeks. And if you remember, I told you that, that most of the women um, who have an infective, infective cause of their delivery will deliver early. So we, you would expect the test to be able to predict the early preterm births and not so much the late preterm births. So we're very excited about these results and we have a clinical trial designed, un hopefully under consideration by the NHMRC um, uh, to, uh, to prove that if you treat these women based on the test, you will lower the preterm birth rate. And then we can roll it out um, and sell the test. Uh, 350 million people deliver every year. Um, even if we only sell it to 10% of the women and I only get a dollar, that's $35 million a year, so I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, a huge dream, yeah. Uh, okay, moving on to... Um, to uh, the anti-inflammatory agents. Right, so inflammation. Pregnancy is a state of heightened inflammation uh, and that inflammation is suppressed by the effects of progesterone. And I like to think of it as, as this sort of balance, this, this pivotal balance here. So progesterone is keeping the myometrium quiescent and helping to counteract any effects of progesterone. And as pregnancy uh, um, progresses, things happen, you get increased oxidative stress, the placenta starts to age, it produces inflammatory mediators into the maternal bloodstream. Um, the fetal organs start to mature, particularly the substance produced in the lungs. All these things start to provoke an inflammatory response. And as the gestational age slide over here sort of moves to the right, then the inflammation outweighs the effects of progesterone and eventually you get a precipitously rise in the last few weeks, causing, uh, causing the inflammatory response that you need to deliver, um, to cause delivery and, and uh, labor and delivery. So how do we, um, how do we uh, exploit this in terms of prevention and treatment of inflammation for getting better clinical outcomes? So firstly, we've got to decide what the goal is. Um, is it delaying delivery or improving neonatal health? Um, how does the presence or absence of intrauterine infection impact upon inflammatory treatment strategies? And as I said before, I think you always really have to assume that there's a silent infection, and so you've got to give antibiotics at the same time. Is the therapy aimed at preventing chronic inflammation or treating women in preterm labor? In other words, is this a, a prophylactic treatment that you start early in pregnancy or are you just treating an acute uh, situation where someone's in preterm labor, probably with massive inflammation? Um, who do we treat and when do we treat? How do we diagnose? How do we figure out who really has uh, uh, at risk of, of high levels of inflammation and adverse outcomes? What drugs do we have available? How safe are they? Uh, what are the potential risks? not only to the mother, but to the fetus. Um, and importantly, do our experimental models mimic the most clinically relevant scenarios? So to answer some of those questions, so the primary goal first is to improve neonatal long-term outcome. We want to delay labor, that's true, uh, but not at the consequence of, of, of neonatal health. Um, for prevention, uh, maternal infection inflammation is the therapeutic target. For treatment, in other words, of symptomatic women, Therapy should mitigate the effects of inflammation and, and or um, infection on the fetus. As I said before, preventing preterm birth shouldn't put the fetus at risk. Um, 
And as I've also said before, absence of a detectable intra-amyotic infection or inflammation doesn't rule out chorionitis because it's basically impossible to tell until the baby's delivered. Um, and, and as a consequence, I think we need to give dual antibiotic anti-inflammatory therapy uh, for optimal benefits. So we know quite a lot about what drives uh, inflammation in the absence of infection and some of, the causes, some of the triggers and the molecular drivers are on this slide here. There's intracellular and extracellular, and I'm not going to go through them as for, for uh, time and also because it's a more of a general audience, uh, but we know a lot about these. Um, there's, we can measure some of them, but lots we can't measure. A lot of them are intra, intracellular or intraanotic, so um, it's useful information. But what is particularly useful in terms of uh, in terms of exploiting this information is the, is the endpoint um, inflammatory signaling is driven by, uh, by these sensing molecules called toll-like receptors in almost all cases. So if we can look at toll-like receptors as the endpoint target, we can basically cover all of those multiple molecular mechanisms um, and, and prevent inflammation-driven preterm birth in many, many cases. Uh, right, so protection and prevention in at-risk asymptomatic women. So these will be women, uh, perhaps, who have a high CRP or a high IL-6 or something in their blood, have a history of an inflammatory condition such as obesity or diabetes, or maybe have an infection such as a, a flu infection, uh, some kind of infectious disease. So um, uh, the, whatever we give would have to be given chronic, probably over a long period of time, maybe start early in pregnancy, um, obviously, in those conditions, then maternal and fetal safety would have to would be paramount because these are low-risk women, uh, so the tolerance for adverse effects is very low. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in a lot of different things, and dietary supplements have, 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 have been looked at. Um, there's some quite interesting data, epidemiological data, showing that people who have certain diets in pregnancy have much lower rates of preterm birth than others. Um, I think that's, um, you know, it's epidemiological data, and sorry, Michael, but, you know, you can interpret this a long way, there's a lot of confounders, but it is, it is interesting. Uh, and in the grey on the slide there are some, um, some of the substances that have been sort of raised and looked at, and we're actually looking at this new nano-curcumin uh, formulation. So you might know about curcumin, kind of a wonder drug, but it's very poorly absorbed and doesn't really do anything, uh, but there's a formulation that greatly increases its, its oral bioavailability. Um, and totally transforms what it can do in terms of a uh, therapeutic effect. Um, you've got to look at bioavailability, as I said, stability and quality. Does it cross the placenta? You wouldn't want it to cross the placenta in these conditions. Um, how does it affect the maternal immunity? Because you don't want to make the mother more susceptible to a disease because you suppress some kind of immune response. Um, and if you take it, does it actually delay term later? Uh, on the other situation is for those who are symptomatic, so they probably have a raging in, uh, infection and or inflammation and uh, have turned up in the preterm labour clinic. Uh, there's, again, a lot of drugs that have been looked at. We've looked at the second of those, the CSAIDs, the cytokine suppressive anti-inflammatory drugs, um, TLR4 antagonists, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, a whole lot of other things. So these would have to be very, very powerful drugs. You would administer them quite acutely in a short space of time for someone who's in preterm labor to try and mitigate the effects of the inflammation on the fetus, particularly the fetal brain. You need to spare the fetal brain as much as possible because it's very susceptible to damaging effects of inflammation. So again, you, it'd have to be effective, safe. Uh, you'd want placental transfer if you gave it to the mother. Um, it would have to uh, uh, leave, uh, preserve maternal immunity and again, not affect preterm um, term labor. So I'm not, uh, this is only one mechanistic slide, so I'm just gonna go through it very briefly. So we have uh, the pattern uh, sensors here respond to various bacterial ligands on the top, uh, going through uh, a, a, a common pathway, a shared pathway involving this enzyme called PAC1, and then bifurcating to the MAP kinase and the NF kappa B pathway. These regulate the transcription of all the inflammatory genes we know about, causing myometrial contraction, ripening, and membrane uh, rupture and delivery. So uh, there's a number of different approaches. You can, you can target each of these little red uh, dots here as a drug kind of target with drugs that have been shown to, to do uh, various things. The first one I'm going to talk about briefly is this drug called octazeanol, which we've been working on. We've shown in the, uh, in the sheep that it, it blocks the inflammatory response in utero. Um, in human placentas delivered preterm, it, it blocks the inflammatory response. Its, a, its attraction is that it, it acts on both of these pathways here, but won't affect them through con their constitutive activity 
and nf kappa b and, and MAP kinase have lots of important roles in the cell. So it stops them being activated in response to a whole lot of inflammatory mediators, not just from bacteria, but from other things as well. So um, it should be pretty effective un in many, many circumstances. Um, we've got some studies underway in rats uh, and a collaborative project with Sarah looking at this drug in her um, mouse model. The next drug I want to talk about is, uh, in fact, Sarah's drug. Sorry, Sarah, I'm going to present some of your data. I hope that's okay. Uh, this is a drug that targets the, uh, the, the receptor for LPS, TLR4, and this is a drug called plus naloxone. Uh, plus naloxone, you've probably heard of naloxone. It's the drug that you give opioid addicts to block the effects of opioids. Well, this is, a, this is, a, um, this is an isoform of, of naloxone that doesn't act as an opioid, but exerts very potent anti-inflammatory effects. And Sarah published this very nice paper showing uh, in, in mice uh, given uh, bacteria. It's a bit grey, hard to see from here, but th th this is the stimulated on the third bar, um, and then on the right-hand side is the suppressed with naloxone. You can see a whole lot of cytokines and genes being uh, affected, and perhaps more impressive on, in the LPS model, um, increase in pup survival. And if you look here, these are the LPS, uh, sorry, these are the LPS treated pups here. You can see greatly reduced uh, growth. Uh, completely protected by the, by the naloxone, plus a whole lot of other effects uh, and preterm birth rates. So very impressive and a very exciting uh, drug, and we're going to compare this with our, um, with our TAC1 inhibitor uh, to see whether well, one or the other uh, is, is better in different circumstances, what dose, what kind of timing needs to be um, considered. The second uh, drug I'd like to talk about is, is a quite a new approach. This is uh, an allosteric receptor antagonist called right vela. And you might be confused to think I'm talking about Rivita. Uh, please, it's not the same thing. Don't go home and tell Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Keelan said you can take Rivita to stop preterm birth. Uh, it's a peptide, nothing to do with a biscuit, uh, and it's actually named after the amino acid sequence, if you're familiar with that. Um, so this was developed um, in Canada a few years ago by Sylvain Shemtob and his team, and they published this very nice paper, which I reviewed and said, hey, this is fantastic. Uh, and so I uh, started a collaboration with them. Um, and this uh, works by um, stopping the binding of uh, the accessory protein to the receptor for the IL-1 receptor. And interleukin-1 is one of the most powerful drivers of inflammation in the body. It's very important in the neonatal brain. It's elevated in cord blood and from infected, feet, infected uh, neonates um, and is a very good target. In fact, there's a drug that works uh, on it. It's called Kinaret. It's available um, uh, commercially. It's very expensive. Um, so the peptide, if you can see here where it says 101.1, the peptide actually uh, binds here and blocks the, bind the binding of the two components of the receptor. So it blocks the receptor activity. Um, I think I skip that. Uh, and this is a brief summary of all the things it does. It really is amazingly effective in, in the mouse model. Um, the right relay is in the third bar. And some of these are stimulated with IL-1, some with LPS. Um, some of them have Kinaret. You can see that the right velar is much more effective than Kinaret. And right across the board, it's having profoundly protective anti-inflammatory effects. So again, this is another project that we've got in with the NHMRC. We're going to test this in human cells and human tissues, look at its transfer across the placenta, do more studies in the mouse, more studies in the spiny mouse with Haley Dickinson, and importantly in the sheep, directly uh, intramyotically in the sheep to look at long-term, uh, short-term, long-term outcomes in the, in the fetal sheep model from Perth. So... Uh, Summary. Firstly, prevention is better than cure. If you can prevent the inflammation and the infection, that's, that's best. The antibiotics will work if we can decide who to give them to. So hopefully we've made a big advance there. Um, you've got to have th different therapeutic strategies for prevention and treatment uh, in, under different circumstances. The low-risk women early in pregnancy or the women at high risk who's turned up with preterm birth. Different drugs, different timing, different uh, safety issues. Um, we've made significant progress, I think, in all these uh, scenarios and some exciting um, things to come. Uh, but I just raise a flag of caution. Uh, uh, history is littered with great things that worked in animal models that when translated into the human scenario and in clinical trials just falls down and the heterogeneity and all the confounders completely destroy everything. So um, although I'm a permanent optimist and I think we've got uh, some great ideas to follow up, um, you know, the, uh, success is uh, not guaranteed. And, and don't put your money on it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. How exciting. Lots of wonderful drugs.
in the pipeline to tackle preterm birth. Can I invite all four speakers to come and take a seat here on the podium? We have Hannah who's going to run around with the microphone and so that people can ask questions. We have 15, 20 minutes perhaps left for a panel discussion. So, questions from the audience? Here, on my right. Uh, John Jovic, a question to Jeff Keelan. Um, in preventing preterm delivery, you've talked about the organisms, particularly the ureoplasma, one species. What about, um, has anybody shown that if you treat women before they conceive, let's say within the three months, three months before, with uh, antibiotics uh, against these particular organisms, has that been shown to make a difference? And before you answer, women who are coming for fertility treatment, they're in a prime situation to have all this screening and pre-treatment before going into their IVF program. So it makes me wonder if someone's already done a study there and uh, provides the answer. Yeah, that's a good question, John. Um, as far as I know, the answer is no. I haven't seen any study where that's been done. Um, theoretically, it would work if you could identify women with a, you know, with a risky uh, microorganism profile. So our test, basically, that's, that's what it does. It identifies those with a certain serovirus of um, ureoplasma plus two other high-risk associated organisms. So you could apply that to your cohort of women and, uh, and test the hypothesis, but I don't think it's ever been done. It should work. But I guess that gets to the question of whether there's a dysbiosis, whether it's a dysbiosis, whether it's an infection, and when that dysbiosis originates and how that's affected by the progression of the pregnancy. So have you thought about those it issues? Before 20 weeks. Because at 20 weeks, if you make Microphone. Fluid, uh, there's no urea in the of fluid. So the infection happens after, in the second half of pregnancy. Uh, can, I, can I add something? Hello, John. There, there's the opportunity to do harm here. So there have been four randomised controlled trials showing that metronidazole, flagell, increases your risk of preterm birth. So we use it with great caution in pregnancy now. And of those four, one of them was between pregnancies. So giving flagell between pregnancies increased the risk of subsequent preterm birth. And that that would, you would imagine would be due to dysbiosis, as Sarah just speculated. So, so just giving antibiotics is, is, is no, no great panacea. And as Jeff ended his talk, uh, that might, the, the dysbiosis might increase your risk. Can I just clarify there that we, we would never give metronidazole. Uh, it doesn't work, it makes things worse, and it doesn't kill urea plasma. So we would give the right antibiotic for the, for the bud. Yes. Not to mention our major concerns with overuse of antibiotics, I think, and uh, increasing understanding of the adverse impact of yeah. inappropriate use. Yeah, because I also just yeah. add that our treatment regime has a probiotic, a vaginal probiotic, after the antibiotics. Um, uh, I think there's very clear evidence that if you restore vaginal abiosis after antibiotics, you reduce the rate of preterm birth and other complications. Uh, and as, as uh, Sarah said, um, you know, sustained periods of dysbiosis which occur after antibiotic treatment are, are, could be potentially be quite harmful. So we have a probiotic in our regime. So we have a Yakult for the vagina? Uh, yeah, basically, but it's a, a, um, a commercial product designed specifically for that purpose. Okay, that's exciting. Anybody else <laughs> follow up on that one? <laughs> Well, I can ask the question I'm dying to ask, and that's, why don't women give birth in aeroplanes, John? I think you told us that all we need to do is build a pressure chamber, pop all the threatened preterm birth women inside that, and they'll be just fine. Yeah, well, we, we don't know. We're, Western Australia is the only place that follows this protocol uh, of not sending out an obstetric flying squad. Uh, Queensland, our next biggest state, has the FROGS, the Far Regional ONG Service, which runs that. Uh, so what w women at term can deliver in flight, so there have been term deliveries of women being transferred down to clinics, etc. But why don't pre-termers deliver? Uh, we don't know. We've d we, we did a big review. Uh, we did 500 consecutive births. We published it in Ann's job about a year or two ago. 
and basically we reviewed everything we could get out of the flight notes, then handed it to our senior biostatistician and said, tell us what's going on. None of them had delivered, of course, until, until they got to King Edward. And then she found, and very robust, couldn't get rid of it, that if the plane gets to 14,000 feet, the woman will stay pregnant an extra five days. So there's some altitude effect. So we approached RFDS, who are our collaborators, uh, with the obvious <coughs> experiment that we would want to do, and that is we would get one of our sheep, put it into preterm labor, put it in an RFDS <laughs> aeroplane, up to 14,000 <laughs> feet, but they've rejected our application to do that. Uh, but so so we're, we're going to do, we just initiated, we're putting an army of medical students and junior doctors together to try to review all 7,000 uh, and to try to get, get to the bottom of it. We don't know whether to put women in a, bar uh, in a barrow chamber, which is obviously one of the things, but we've, uh, I, I spoke to an um, aeromedical expert from the military recently who said that the factor that we haven't considered yet is vibration. Mm -hmm. So vibration is a very big thing in the Air Force regarding human performance. So vibration, altitude, unlikely to be hypoxia because they're all on oxygen, or perhaps just adrenergic receptor um, a a activation because women know they must not. But anyway, that we don't know the answer, but we're doing our best. I'm, I'm telling everybody I'm handing that to the next generation. It's going to okay. take a generation to answer. Well, I can tell you for our mice, vibration induces preterm birth. The builders <laughs> have done that experiment already for us. <laughs> Um, okay. Questions? One over here on my right. Um, hi everybody. Um, that was a really good talk. Thanks so much. I've learned a lot. Um, the question I have is generally to John really because I'm interested in the whole ethnicity shift with preterm. Um, I'm wondering that um, when, when they, they, ha they might have an etiology that is different in those countries. So for example like in China for preterm birth, it could be mostly um, a, a bacterial or microbial um, something, and then as the etiology kind of changes, or they have an additive etiology when they come to a country where hygiene is of a different standard, and maybe even medical care or nutrition, I'm not sure, but there's been these been, uh, factors involved, and I'd just like to see if there's some sort of answer to that. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, it's fascinating, and it's, it's going to take a whole of research community effort to answer, but it's terribly important. We invested five years uh, trying to answer the obvious hypothesis, which that it's due to sexual intercourse during pregnancy. Because in traditional Chinese society, when a woman is pregnant, she does not have sex. Whereas in the Western world, uh, it's, it's business as usual. Uh, and uh, so, but there were no data in the English or the Chinese literature on sexual activity in pregnancy. And uh, so we, d we did a big parallel study here in Perth and in Nanjing uh, at the time of genetic amniocentesis. And to cut a long story short, the, there's a curve of sexual activity during pregnancy uh, for here in Australia, and it's, it, it's just shifted to the left in China. There still is sexual activity, but we could find no correlation between sexual activity and, and rates of preterm labor or inflammatory cytokines in the amniotic fluid. So we could find nothing to support the hypothesis, thank goodness, because no tyrant in history has ever told men they can't have sex. So when you think about it, not even Stalin did that. So, so uh, thank goodness there's no correlation. Uh, but but uh, it's, it, look, it's all related somehow to belonging. And, and people in communities that, that have been either the result of slavery or disenfranchisement uh, have worse health care outcomes and it is multi-generational. And it is, I think it is somehow related to that. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very, very complicated. But the effect in Chinese women coming down here to Western Australia is very marked, as I showed you. Mm -hmm. But we're looking for ideas. Can we have some questions for Jackie and Michael? I've got one for Jackie. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Yogesh Makanji from Anschlab. This question for Jackie Boyle. Mm -hmm. um, it's alarming to see the increased incidence of uh, PCOS in Aboriginal women, the 22%. Could you elaborate uh, on that and what sort of diagnostic and support services are available for this women? Thanks. Um, so we think that it's so 
probably it's multifactorial, so it's possibly related to some of those intergenerational effects in birth weight. Um, a lot of it seems to be related to increased central obesity, so um, they have increased central obesity and lower BMI, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. Um, and so as a part of that overall increase in obesity, it's, it is, um, that's why it's increasing. I think that in terms of diagnosis, so for women who live in rural and remote areas, it's often difficult for them to access ultrasounds. Um, so the diagnosis has been a bit limited in terms, if you look at that Rotterdam criteria with the three criteria, they often don't get the ultrasound, but if they have the hyperandrogenism and the irregular cycles, they'll still get diagnosed. I think the awareness is actually building, um, so, uh, and that there is better care being provided. So in the Torres Strait, there, that clinic was set up in response to the recognition of the increased prevalence and the significant problems that it's causing. And we also did an evaluation of um, a clinic in Central Australia recently, and they're actually getting really good at diagnosing women. I think that awareness is really increasing. I think the difficult step is actually what you do and managing it. Um, and so women aren't turning up having difficulty getting pregnant or with diabetes. I think that's actually the gap is the management, not so much the diagnosis now. I wanted to ask Jackie, I was struck by a comment that you made, which I've never heard before, and perhaps I've got this wrong, but of the women who were not intending to become pregnant, 25% of them had been on the contraceptive pill. Yes. That raised the question in my mind when we think about the early pregnancy and periconceptional origins of many of the gestational disorders that we're also discussing. Is there an adverse impact of conceiving on the pill? Has anybody ever looked at that? Especially in the context of Michael's work around climate and the altered um, hormonal environment that one might expect and how that influences not just fertility but the progression of pregnancy. It could be an interesting question. It could, yeah. I think uh, it has been looked at but not in a comprehensive way because I think we haven't actually recognised. Um, it's more that... Yeah, that it's more been women, the studies that have looked at it have been more women who've been taking the pill and maybe forgotten one, but there's a lot of intermittent use that I is not necessarily reported. So no, it's actually a good, a good point, yeah. Mm. Michael. Um, may, I, may I add that there may also be a fetal interaction with the fetal sex, because uh, we certainly see that with women who take clomiphene in pregnancy, that in our data, uh, the, the male fetus is particularly adversely affected, both in terms of the gestation and the risk of birth defects. Hannah, did you have a question? Lisa? Yeah. Hi, Lisa Rackerson from the University of Queensland. I've actually got a, a, a question for Michael Davies. I thought your um, data that was showing that there seems to be um, some natural selection towards people that can um, uh, avoid it or uh, survive an obesogenic diet is quite interesting. And, and what does that, do you think, or shadow for what could happen in the population in terms of the obesity rates? Yeah, I think, I th uh, well, I found uh, taking that approach really quite helpful that, uh, for example, there may have been people who, um, whose parents predated the, the First World War and they, uh, they were relatively healthy as children and they appear to be uh, relatively uh, immune uh, to an obesog obesogenic environment by contrast uh, those parents who, who perhaps went through privation from the Second World War and their children in turn display some of the phenotype uh, of, of the Dutch famine, uh, which are where they're prone to metabolic disorders and, and, and obesity in an obesogenic environment. So, the, I, so I think there's actually been a, a very interesting whole generation that's now sweeping through. Uh, and I think one of the promising things is, is that uh, that may well uh, eventually wash out. Uh, and we certainly, and one of the components, a really important component of that, is the compensation in, in increased body mass by increased height. There's a bit of a, there's a, there's a great lag function there, because we can increase our, our girth uh, instantly, but our height, there's a, there's a critical window there, but that's actually strongly also controlled uh, uh, in, uh, intergenerationally uh, through maternal constraint and the setting of growth parameters through the parents. However, that can also uh, appears to be really quite expandable. If we, if we look at the extraordinary growth of, of the Dutch, uh, for example, now. But we even see that in our data, where in a single generation, we compared the, the heights and weights of the mothers 
1975, and uh, there were 63, uh, 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 64 kilos in the first trimester of pregnancy. The daughters in a non-pregnant state at the age of 30 were 73 kilos, but four centimeters taller. So, and that's, so they're, they're simply bigger in all ways in a single generation. So we're seeing, we're seeing something happening really uh, very rapid. Uh, the, 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 clo the clothes manufacturers are aware of this, and, and the bra manufacturers. Uh, but we may actually also, as something that David Barker flagged, that some of these parameters of growth may also bring with them a separate pathology. So we've gone through the, uh, the, the epidemic of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and uh, the, the second wave may be an epidemic of cancer. Uh, Michael, how much of this is attributable to the 21st century technologies that we have for managing our reproduction? Um, well, I'm not sure, uh, but these, these are largely mediated through uh, nutrition transitions, the ones that I'm referring to. But I think you showed in some of your data that assisted reproductive technologies are linked with programming altered outcomes. I, w I will indeed. That I, I'm afraid I, I left off a couple of really quite critical slides there, but the, we're, we've published some data with uh, Leo, Leonie, Leonie Holbrun where we did a follow-up of a small group of, of adults at age 20 who uh, were born from assisted conception and they've got uh, a, a impaired glucose tolerance. Okay. So, there's n so there's now uh, a, a body of studies looking at uh, uh, observing generalised endothelial dysfunction, uh, for example, uh, and doing strange things, sending, sending the kids to the, to, to the top of a mountain uh, and, then, and then exercising them when they got back to them. So there's some really interesting interactions here between early life programming, and the how they increased capacity we have to manage our reproduction, the incidence of these gestational disorders and how all these things are interacting. Well, it's, and, it's forming, and it's forming an interesting mm -hmm. sort of selection pressure given that it's, uh, in Australia it's now uh, pushing up towards 5% five, five of all, all births in Australia now as a result of uh, invasive treatment. And then globally, ICSI, which were found to be uh, uh, unnecessarily invasive in terms of live birth rates, now accounts for 70% of all treatment cycles globally. Okay, so any further questions? It looks to me like there's a bunch of people at the door wanting to come in. So I think we will wrap up there. Can I join... Uh, I'll ask you to join with me in thanking Jackie, Michael, John and Jeff for their fabulous talks.